Um, the subject is achieving the perfect paint job, which is a bit of a misnomer because perfection doesn't exist, but boy, we want to chase it. Ask any golfer, <laughs> okay? So, um, achieving the perfect paint job is a really interesting thing, and we're gonna get right back to that, but I wanted to actually give a really nice shout out and a thank you to the Eastwood Company uh, for, for hosting things like this, and the online video, and the focus on training, and, and putting out the message that you can do this, and you can, their slogan is do the job right. And, and that's the message that we want to send. And uh, I'm proud to be associated with the Eastwood Company because of the spin on education. If you know me, I started Paint Education Instructional Videos in 1998. My first video was picked up by Eastwood in 1999, and I've been producing instructional uh, programs and DVDs uh, ever since and uh, I've got a, a wonderful long-standing relationship with Eastwood and they're just they've been really good to me and it's a good place they don't just want to sell you stuff they want to show you how to use it so you've got a beautiful positive experience with that piece of equipment and by the way I don't bite and I don't kick very high um, even though well, never mind I won't go there but if you guys want to come in a little bit um, we can make some room and um, yeah, just come on in, cheat a little, little bit, and and uh, you know get a little closer. And throughout this, I want you guys to ask questions. Uh, Bill was here last year. I recognize your face, and there's some familiar faces as well. So please, this is about you guys. This is, you know, I know what I know how to do, but I don't know what you guys know how to do. And we can learn from each other. You know, I love to pass on the skills that have been passed on to me, but that's not the end of it. We can trade information. I learn more from doing these seminars. And Ron Covell, uh, you know this as well. We learn from, from doing these demos and these, you know, lectures and seminars uh, just as we're passing on skills. So please, feel free. Raise your hand, bust me uh, if you got questions or if you've got a better way to do it. You know, my dad told me a long time ago, there's more than one right way to do things. There's more than one way to get from point A to point B. And there's a lot of fun stuff in the middle. So please feel free to, um, to ask questions in the middle of something. If you have a different opinion, I'm all about it because I want to learn more too. So the other question, the, the pink elephant in the room, um, how many guys have watched the, the truck show on Spike Network? Thank you guys for watching that. I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm no longer with the show. Um, last weekend, we aired my final goodbye. We talked with Courtney, and, uh, and it was a tough decision to make. It was a wonderful, wonderful job for eight seasons, 190 episodes, and um, it was time for me to focus on education and to partner up with Eastwood and to do what I'm, uh, what I'm really hoping is going to be a, a large expansion on the educational format that Eastwood provides. And um, it, it's a great thing. So thanks for watching the shows. I really appreciate it. There's more coming. We're doing a web show. It's called Hands on Cars and kind of a play on words. But we're using, it's the same type of thing. It's how-to stuff. We don't have the time rules of television. But it's on the internet. It's on Eastwood's YouTube channel. Look it up. It's a lot of fun. I'm having a ball doing it. We've got a budget of about $36 an episode. So, so we're using video, you know, but the production value is there. It's okay, but, um, but it, it's a lot of fun and it's good information. And like I said, we're not tied to those two and a half minute segments on television that I've been tied to for 12 years now with the Spike channels and the DIY stuff that I did before that. So we're able to, to do that and we get to go to events. We do, you know, uh, broadcasts from, um, from different car shows and events, and it's a real fun show. So please watch Hands on Cars online. Doesn't cost you a dime. You don't even need cable. So um, having said that, I also want to say I've got a new instructional title out. This is Fiberglass Repair. Uh, this has been about a year in the works, and um, it's, it's, it's a really interesting technology. I hated fiberglass. I hated it. It made me itch, and, and I didn't understand it. And when I put myself, forced myself through the learning curve to understand fiberglass, um, now I don't hate it so much, and and I can manage it, and I can I can do things with fiberglass that I was, I was um, not afraid to do, but but it it has empowered me. It, building the DVD, making the video, has made me a better technician for for that, and it's taught me things about fiberglass that I hope you guys uh, can learn too. The importance of gel coating, using that gel coat for an M and M coating to make that substrate very strong. Uh, kit cars, who's built a kit car? Okay, you've got the mold seam lines where these things are molded together. I show you in the DVD how to make sure those, those mold seam lines don't map through your paint, things like that. So anyway, if you're into fiberglass, if you've got a project coming up, check it out, it's available from the Eastwood website. So, we have 
I can't figure out if it's a CJ or a Dodge Power Wagon, but it's definitely some sort of a, a, a Mopar or a Jeep. And <laughs> I, I, I kind of agree, it's kind of a Jeep, but, um, and so wheelbase. <laughs> but, yeah, but look at the approach angles we've got. It's cool, we've got a lot of suspension travel potential. So anyway, I'm, I'm proud of a little Jeep here. What's the difference between a chip foos paint job and a Mako paint job? What's the difference between a chip foos paint job and a Mako paint job? All these are great answers. The answer that I want to give is nothing and everything. Technically, there's no difference. It's a chemical bond on a prepped surface. It's paint. It's paint. It's, it's one technology. There's only two ways to make paint stick, chemically or mechanically. Mechanical is a scratch pattern. Uh, chemically is two chemicals cross-linking together. That's what happens at Mako, and that's what happens at Chip Foo Studios. So it's the same. The difference, somebody said the prep. Yes, the prep. But technically, it's the same. The difference is the follow-through. It's the passion. It's finishing the job. Uh, and I'm not banging on Mako because they provide a function. They give cheap, refinished jobs, and, and that's, that provides a service to people that need that particular thing. But the point I want to make is that the difference is up to us as technicians, as painters, as weekend warriors, the difference in the Chip Foose paint job and the Mako paint job is what we put into it and what we pull out of our hearts and the, the zen that we can get into and, and really see the end result as we're doing it. The time we put in, the follow through, the finish up. You know, for instance, if you're working filler and you got a little blob right here, well, yeah, you could prime it and then block the primer and paint it and stack it up and all that kind of stuff. Or you could block your filler off, prepare your substrate, finish step one before you go to step two. That's the difference. And um, it's, it's really empowering for me to know that yeah, I'm not the best painter, you know, but I can achieve that type of work if I use the follow through and you guys can too. And it's really just as simple as that. So keep that in the back of the noggin. When you're doing a project, it's just about the timing. It's, it's, it's about taking what you know and, and just finishing the job. So it, kind of a trick question, but a fun one to ask yourself and a fun one to answer. There's a bunch of factors involved with, with painting. How many guys are painters? How many guys are professional painters? TC Penix, I would call you a professional painter, but you said no. There's your spray environment is key. If you've ever been a professional painter, I spent a lot of time in body shops and collision repair. Um, a $50,000 spray booth, a $10,000 screw type rotary air compressor to get perfect air. There's a lot of stuff that a professional body shop has to happen. So that painter never has to think about air. Us, as weekend warriors, we got to think about air. You got to have the air delivery. Paint is delivered. It used to be delivered, you remember the Bink 7 guns, the, the siphon fed guns, Bink 7 was the gun. That was the gun, baby, when I started painting. A Bink 7 was the tool, it was a nice gun. And about 65 PSI at the inlet, and that sucker, you had a pattern about this wide, and you could fill this entire exhibit hall with overspray in about two and a half minutes. And, you know, most of the paint, the transfer efficiency was horrid. And that's why the EPA has regulated paints and equipment to keep that overspray and those VOCs out of the atmosphere. You know, I mean, there's terms that float around, you know, nature Nazis and things like that. The regulations are in place because of the fact that, you know, I have the philosophy that I want to leave this place when I move on to wherever we move on to when we pass. I want to leave it in as good a shape as I can for the next guy. So, you know, we just have to sort of embrace EPA and OSHA regulations because it's just making, it's refining the systems, there's less pollution, and that's really what it's about. But the paint technology changes. The, the one constant is the quality of air. So, when you're setting up a home spray environment, uh, you have to make sure that you're, speaking of air, this thing's leaking and it's going up my pant leg and it's really quite refreshing, I'm just saying. So I'm gonna move over here before I smile too big. But, um, the quality of air is absolutely important and there's ways to mimic a professional environment without spending a lot of money. Now if you get a chance to look, there's a desiccant drying system attached to the side of this table. It's a two or three stage dryer on the side of here. Um, I can't... Yeah, it's a two stage dryer with a, with a pressure regulator. Uh, Eastwood also has the three and four stage drying systems with, with desiccant in them. They can be a little bit spendy. But 
if you're doing more than one paint job, you kind of owe it to yourself to make sure that you can scrub your air, make it as clean and dry as possible. Do you know what desiccant is? Okay, desiccant, for the guys that don't know, the little blister packs that you get when you buy a computer, the little things with the little sil uh, silica you know, nuggets in them, it's silicon, not silicone, because silicone, as we know, reacts with paint. It wicks moisture out of the air. And just it's because the, uh, the electronics that we buy are shipped with silica blister packs in them, uh, the desiccant drying systems, the air passes through the desiccant, which is silica, which wicks moisture out. It's beautiful. Eastwood also has, if you don't want to spend the money on a three-stage drying system, there's a desiccant hose. It's a, it's a 24, no, 36-inch desiccant hose filled with the desiccant, and it's, it's a good value. Um, you can clean your paint system, and it runs in line with your spray gun. So think about that if you're on a budget, if you don't paint, you know, very many projects. So setting up your home, home environment, it's all about the quality of air and what happens with the air. So I'm not gonna belabor the point, but there's another thing I wanna say. When you're dealing with an air compressor, and I get this question all the time with guys saying, I have a two horse, 30 gallon compressor with wheels on it that I can pull around. Can I paint a car with that? Kind of a trick question, because just like there's no difference between Chip Foose and Mako, which there is, um, Yes, you can paint a car with that roll-around air compressor, but you really shouldn't because you're not going to be happy with the results. There's not enough cubic feet per minute. There's not enough CFM. Um, it's not going to do the job. Minimum requirement for an air compressor for a home spray environment, a five-horse pump, preferably a two-stage compressor with a cast iron pump because it dissipates heat better, and a minimum of 60 gallons storage capacity. 60 gallons storage capacity, five-horse pump, two-stage, you're rocking. You can do an all-over paint job on a full-size vehicle. Now, if you're breaking things apart and doing smaller components, a small fender, that 30-gallon compressor with a two-horse pump, yeah, you can do that. Or if you're doing a motorcycle or a smaller project, yeah, you can get away with that. But for an all-over paint job, that's kind of the benchmark, so you can kind of keep that in mind. So I was talking about CFM. Back in the big seven days, pressure is what mattered. 65 pounds pressure at that inlet of that gun, and the pressure is what atomized paint. As the paint has changed over the years, it's become pancake syrup. It's very, very thick. And now what breaks up paint is air volume, not air pressure. So this spray gun here operates on about 18 to 20 PSI at the inlet. That's really low. And it only needs about nine CFM to really pr you know, properly atomize paint. Whereas the big seven, I, I don't know um, what the CFM was with a 5 sixteenths hose, but okay, here's the analogy. Um, you can put 60 PSI through a garden straw or th through a, a drinking straw, put your hand on the end, you know, you're gonna feel it. But if you put 60 PSI through a culvert pipe, it's the same pressure, but it's a whole lot more volume. That's what you need to wrap your head around with paint delivery. So volume is key. CFM is what, the, what, what you have to consider. So it's a really interesting thing. So you, the HVLP stands for high volume CFM, low pressure. So you have to have the proper amount of CFM. Make sure to match your compressor to your spray gun. Eastwood makes it easy because they have the CFM requirements. Every paint gun manufacturer has the CFM requirements. Um, I want to ask one more question. Is, has anybody ever looked at a paint gun recommendation or uh, advertisement and they advertise an air cap pressure, 20 pounds of the air cap? Who knows what that means? I don't either. No, I know what it means, but, but there's no way to measure that. It's a very expensive gauge that measures the air coming out of the air horns and when your needle and seat gets depressed with the trigger, it's a combination of that. It's very sophisticated measurement. It's a legality that they have to put that measurement on there because it ties in with the CFM and the VOCs that are gonna go out and be produced by that gun. It means nothing to you and I. What matters to us is the inlet pressure. So when you're shopping for a spray gun and it says um, 20 PSI at the cap, it typically means about 30 at the inlet. That translates to 20 at the cap, so or 10 PSI, whatever, the, 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 it's the same thing. So think about it at the inlet. So if you're, if you're 20 PSI at the cap, it's about 30 coming into the gun. So kind of ignore that air cap. Ask what it's gonna be coming into the gun. What's your pressure recommendation there? So I wanna talk about this piece of gear. This is a turbine. Well, no, this is a spray gun. Go ahead and uh, pass that around so people can touch it. It's, it's, it's a spray gun. It's a little bit different, and I'll talk about the controls, but it's essentially a gravity-fed spray gun like this. So 
you got a trigger, you've got a fluid control, and a fan, oh no, you don't have a fluid, you've got a trigger and a fan control, so essentially it's the same thing. The difference is how the air comes through. Uh, whoever, who's, who's heard of a turbine system? I get tech questions all the time about turbine systems. Can I use that? Yes, you can. What's a good one? I'm not sure, because I, I don't use that technology. I'm a pneumatic painter. I like the turbines. I, I like the, the, the traditional delivery. And I always had trouble with, um, with the air being superheated by the older turbine style guns. Well, these guys have outsmarted us again, and we've got, this is a five stage electric turbine, and um, is there any way to get AC to this? If, yeah, it just I just want to turn it on and, and, and kind of. While I'm doing this, what I, the point I wanted to make was that the problem I had with turbines in the past was that they superheat the air and it fools the paint into thinking it's 100 degrees outside and it dries before it hits the panel. So you got to overcompensate with reducer, put a 100 degree reducer for a 70 degree day to get paint flow out, to, to eliminate that orange peel, that texture. That, so, but this is a five stage turbine. It doesn't superheat the air. I'm going to turn it on and we're going to put our hands in front of it. It warms it up, but it doesn't heat it. But what the turbine system does is eliminate the need for an air compressor in the first place. You know, and this is not turning into a product demo, I promise. But it's really interesting technology. And if you don't want to spend 1500 bucks on a compressor, this is way less than that. And it eliminates the need for a compressor for painting. It's a neat piece of gear. I've used this at my shop, not this particular one, but they sent me a demo unit to try. What do you think, KT? And I tried it out. It atomizes beautifully. It's a really nice paint delivery system. And because of the fact that it's it's the same feel in my hand, basically. I'm familiar with it, and you guys will be too. So it's another interesting alternative to spending a lot of jack on a compressor. The other interesting thing it does is eliminate the need for any kind of filtration, because there's no air coming into it. It's generating air, wicking it out of the, out of the atmosphere. Cool. And um, it's, it's clean, super dry air. Air out of an air compressor, what does it contain? oils, moistures, that's why it needs to be scrubbed and cleaned. So there's moisture in the air, and especially uh, when it's coming off that hot manifold of the compressor, it's a piston, it's like an engine. An engine, no, it's an air pump, right? So it's, it's hot air, it has to separate, it has to, the moisture has to get out of the air. So, uh, you know, when it cools down, it condensates, and, and all of a sudden we've got to have now a water trap or get rid of that moisture out of our air lines. And since there's no air coming into this guy, it's absolutely clean and dry air. Now, we're solvent painters, Waterborne is coming. Waterborne, it's not bad paint, it's just different. And Waterborne now, the base coat is the only thing that's water, you know what I'm talking about, right? So, um, all the pro shops, and if there's any Canadian guys here, all the Canadian shops have to use Waterborne. Everybody in California, you gotta be Waterborne to be VOC compliant. It's coming, it's not here yet for us, but it's coming. So, kinda get used to that coming down the pike. Um, waterborne paint, reacts to water or moisture in the air supply. There's no moisture or air supply in the turbine. So again, for a waterborne, if we're, we can wear your hobby guys, it might be a cool alternative. The other thing, and this is really interesting, uh, transfer efficiency. Transfer efficiency from this gun is about 35%, which is interestingly enough about the same percentage of efficiency in an internal combustion engine. We're only burning about 35% of the fuel, the rest of it's going out in, in, in waste and exhaust gas. So. 35% transfer efficiency, what that means is that every, when I shoot paint, 35% of, of the paint that came out here lands on my panel. The rest of it is either evaporates or gets sent off in overspray and lands on something else. This sucker has 85% transfer efficiency. So it's a much more efficient way to get the paint from your gun to your project. Interesting stuff, and, 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 it's, and it's worth talking about, because it's, it's, and the biggest thing that that's gonna do is save you money on paint, because most of what you bought and mix, your catalyst, good gosh, I mean, you can spend a lot of money on paint. Uh, so your catalyst, all that stuff goes from your paint gun to your project. So I don't know, man, there's some benefits to it. So anyway, but uh, I wanted to show you this. I feel that air and it'll warm up a little bit, but it's not hot. Yeah, it's starting to barely warm up a little bit. But it's not that superheated air 
from the old turbine systems. So the only thing that I would say would be to make sure that the turbine system itself is in a, is in a don't have it in the booth. <laughs> make sure you're cleaning, you're, you're, you're getting good air, um, you know, from a, from a reliable, you know, where you're not sucking it in from the wrong place. Because it does take air in, pressurizes it, and all that kind of stuff. Wow. All right. Or you can buy one of these and start an oxygen bar, right? <laughs> and you hook it up and, and do it. And yeah, it yeah. Is that, the hose on top, this is just for, um, it's, it's, it, it's, it's not, it was, it's for overflow as well. So you can paint like this and it doesn't leak back. It goes back into the fluid chamber. Yeah. So it's a, it's a coupler. Look at the size of the orifice. We're talking about CFM. Uh, coming into there, that's actually a 5 16 fitting. I highly recommend the big fittings, the, the HVLP fittings, 3 8 ID. It makes a huge difference. But we're getting a bunch of air in this sucker. You know, what's that? So it's, it's the same thing. This man has excellent reflexes. And actually, there's some brochures here if you want. Uh, you know, after the demo, you can come and pick one up. But there's a little bit difference in the controls. This is your, it's a trigger restrictor. It's a fluid control. That controls the amount of fluid coming down into the passage. And typically, there's a fan control. But the fan control here, it's on the nuzzle, or not nuzzle. It's on the nozzle. It's right behind, right behind the air cap. So it's, it's kind of a neat feature. It's a little bit different design. And it's a little quick change thingy. You know, instead of going twist, 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 we can go twist, twist, twist. But it's, it's a, a two thirds turn from a, a round stream to a full fan pattern. So anyway. How wide the fan? The fan, uh, I don't have anything in here. Well, let's give it a shot. And, <laughs> and what'd I do? Oh, you're laughing like a hyena. What, what happened? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> See, you sat in the wrong spot, pal. Okay, so that's, that's elliptical shape. And this is water. Water's gonna give you, a, it's kinda lie a little bit, but water's gonna give you, some, the viscosity is, is way thinner here. Um, but right there, I've got, well, it's, it's about a 12 inch pattern. It's nice. And I painted some stuff. Um, I put a Facebook post out. I'm doing a Camaro project. It's actually a hands on cars project. And I painted the subframe with, uh, with this particular turbine because I wanted to test it out. I did a base clear job with the Boulevard Black and the Rat Rod Flat Clear just to give myself a nice semi gloss look. And um, it, 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 it it's, it's a nice piece of gear. I like it. And I'm going to reach for mine every once in a while, even though I've got a nice booth set up and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so back to perfect paint. So now we know we've got to have a great air supply. Uh, then we have to have a nice spray environment. You know, you can't paint outside and expect insects not to get in. You can't paint in a two-car garage and, and that you've just done a wood project with and expect those you know, tiny fragments of wood to not blow up into your paint. So control your environment. You can make a plastic house or something like that. I've seen guys use PVC to do a structure around, tape it, fan at each end, get your extraction, things like that. You just have to control your environment like that. And I'm not gonna go too much into that because that's a whole other seminar we can talk about. And actually, we're gonna do it sometime online and, and just make a dedicated discrete paint environment and kind of show you guys how to do that to where it's, it's disposable. You mimic a $50,000 spray booth for about 300 bucks. So keep watching the Eastwood channel on YouTube and we'll show you how to do that. But um, your spray environment is very, very important. So just make sure you're controlling your airflow and optimally you want a lot of air evacuation over top of the vehicle and with clean, dry air. Just just kind of have, have that in mind. So the perfect paint job depends on prep. I'm not going to do a prep demo. Ron, <laughs> I'll never forget this. Uh, Ron was a guest on a television show that I was doing, and we made a motorcycle fender. It was an Indian-style motorcycle fender. And, uh, and he had metal finished it out, this beautiful job, and we're talking. And, and I, said, um, I said, so what do you do to get it ready for paint now? And he looked at me and grinned, and he said, I hand it to you. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you know, prep is king. It has to you, you have to follow the steps. And fortunately, there's lots of guides. We, we kind of know what we're doing, but you have to have you have to have your work done. Getting back to that follow through, you've got to do the work, you've got to prep the surfaces, you've got to block the panels, you've got to spend the time, and you've got to get it straight. There's ways to do that. The paint education videos are really good guides. I've got great sections on guide coding, siting the panels, wet checking, using different things like a, a, one of the cotton gloves that you can get at your home centers to increase the tactile sensation on a panel. And you, it really does make a difference in how you perceive what's going on down here. So there's things that you can do, but prep is king. You have to have it. Painting is the reward that we get for all the work that we did prepping the panel. That's it. So again, yeah, that's kind of the key. The perfect paint job, even though it doesn't really exist, the goal is to get there and, and, and prep is king. So the other thing is technique. Technique is muscle memory. If you've heard this, you know, I've done this workshop a bunch of times and I keep saying the same thing over and over again because it's so freaking important to say the same thing over and over again. It's technique, it's muscle memory, it's repetition. There's no magic bullet, man. You got to do the work, you got to train yourself. You have to be proficient. There's a, there's a difference between consciously competent and unconsciously competent, and I love this analogy. Consciously competent is a 16-year-old girl driving a car for the first time. She's gotten her license, she passed the test, she's not hitting the stop sign, she's not bumping into the curb, and she can probably parallel park. Well, because now there's a button. <laughs> You know, so anyway, that's consciously competent, but she better not be texting and she better focus on the driving job that she's doing and she will be safe on the road and we can rest assured that our daughters are not gonna wreck the car because we're consciously competent. It means we have to focus on it, we have to pay attention. Unconsciously competent is Ashley Force. 400 miles an hour in three and a half seconds. She knows how to drive a car. She doesn't have to think about driving a car. You know, she can adjust the radio and she's not gonna run off the road. That's the difference. When you can do something, it's muscle memory. And, and it, it falls into metal shaping, it falls into every skill that we do. Cursive, handwriting, how to bake a cake. It's muscle memory, it's training, it's creating that neuron path and, and doing that. The only way to get that is repetition. So, brings me to an interesting point. I'm hoping there's another spray gun down there. How do you get repetition? Would you reach down below you and pull one of those spray guns off of that stand? How do you get repetition without wasting a whole bunch of paint and how do you get really good at a paint job without spraying paint on your panel? Who's never painted before? Who, who wants to learn? You wanna learn? All right, this is Bill. We're really gonna give him a hard time. Give him a hand. This is Bill Kropp. He's Agazi? Okay, my Canadian brother. How you doing, man? What's what's? It's like the, the, the tennis player. Agassi. Agassi. Okay. All right. I grew up in the British in the South Central Okanagan Valley too in BC, and and uh, so what we're going to do, well, you know, we're going to go back to our little Jeep here, and and Bill's going to work with me, and and I'm going to teach him how to paint. So what we're going to do is, without having any paint in the gun. Ah, without having any paint in the gun, we're gonna go through some exercises and I'm gonna show Bill and you guys some really good ways to uh, everyone's a male coupler and I need a female coupler, but, but we'll get there. All right, we're just gonna switch. But I'm gonna show you some dry application techniques. That's where I'm going with this. All right, here we go. So since this is the only game in town, we're gonna to switch. And by the way, when we do the spraying demo, it's water-based paint, it's craft paint. We're gonna be using low pressure. It, don't worry about it. It's not dangerous, it's not toxic, it's not caustic. We could not get away with it in a union hall. It's safe, so don't worry. Um, and incidentally, controlling your air pressure is key. Personally, these guys get in my way, but it's a nice way to tell. This is a digital air gauge. They're very cost effective, very inexpensive, and you know you can you press the button and it tells you how much air is going in it. There's a big fat zero there now, obviously, because it's not hooked up to an air hose, but it's a neat tool and it's a great way to know how much air is coming into the base of the gun. So 
We're gonna talk about spray technique, hose handling, and all that kind of stuff. All right, here we are. So Bill, come over here. Are you left-handed or right-handed? Right? Okay, so Bill's right-handed, I'm left-handed, doesn't really matter. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to do a, do a function, spray a panel, and I'm gonna stop you when, when I see that you're doing something wrong. I'm gonna bust your technique, okay? So just say you're gonna paint the top of this panel. We can go ahead and start. Yeah. Okay, stop right there. He performed the function of spraying paint. So well done. However, you were up here and you swept. You pulled it up off the panel. So I'm gonna take it out of your hand. What you wanna do is keep in mind that it's a robot analogy. You want to be like a machine to get that perfect distance, which is about six inches off the deck. You want that perfect distance, and your technique has to be like a machine. So, like that, okay? So give it a shot again. Okay, that was better. His technique was parallel. He was perpendicular, but he was sweeping an arc into the paint job. So. Here's something I need you to remember. Um, what I'm gonna do, and sorry for the man touching, but go ahead and do that. I'm gonna guide your hand like this. Okay, yeah, don't worry about triggering. Okay, see what I'm doing, see what's happening with your wrist? Your wrist, your gun has to be perfectly parallel. Your wrist action is very important. It's almost uncomfortable, watch my wrist. I'm here and I'm sweeping there. My gun didn't move at all, either up or down, it's a machine. So it's an uncomfortable position that you have to remember. It. Yeah, straight like that. You want a perfect cone, just, just follow me. Okay, now you're, you're, you're kicking off like that, come down like that. There you go, a little closer to the deck, nice. Okay, okay, now you're curving. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, and you can feel that, you can feel that pressure in your wrist, right? Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Okay, cool. So. Do the same thing, keep it as close to the deck as you can, and now trigger it, now spray. Yeah, okay. He just painted his first hood, that's not bad. Here's what I want you to get used to. Well, actually, um, thank you. When you first crack that trigger, it's just air coming out. Depending on your fluid delivery knob, that dictates how much paint. So, I never, here's what happens when you do that. You can even hear it. You can hear a pulse of air that's coming out, and with the pulse of air that's coming out, you're gonna overload it with paint, and then it corrects to the PSI that you've decided. So when you go like that, and paint like that, you're getting an inconsistent pattern. If you crack the trigger, and trigger it on. You see what I'm doing? So go ahead and give that a shot. Okay. Okay, now your, t your technique went to shit. <laughs> so here's what we're gonna do. Yeah. We gotta get some fluid going through there so you can feel the difference in what I'm talking about. And I'm gonna do a pass and then I want you to mimic what I do. See what I'm talking about, see there's no paint coming through there. When I trigger that sucker, there's no paint coming out. Our craft paint is settled in here. This is live, people. This, I'm not sham wowing you guys, mistakes happen. All right, now we're doing it. Okay, so now, I'm not painting anything. When I, when I make my pass here, I'm feathering the trigger in, and I'm releasing paint, and I'm still keeping the air going through, you know what I mean? So that way you don't get that pulsation of air, that overloaded, and then I'm passing again, and I'm triggering that, and each pass, I'm keeping the air moving through the gun, right? So give that a shot. And you see how my overlap is like that? Keep that in mind too, and we'll talk about that in a sec. 
He's not sweating. I'm sweating. Why is he not sweating? <laughs> You're sweeping a little bit, but you're there. You're getting there. And, and you see what I'm saying about, about keeping the air moving in between? Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the other thing that, that I want you to, okay, set the gun down and, um, Do yeah, you put have it back to stop in. stop at each time or can you just keep going back and forth? Well, okay, that's a good question. His question was, do you have to stop the air, the paint flow every time or can you just keep going? Here's what happens when you do that. I've just got a puddle of paint right there and right there. So no, you can't. You can, but you shouldn't. Um, unless you're moving really wicked fast. It's not good technique. So good technique is to feather the trigger, get your fluid going in there, and, and, and make your passes. Um, you know what I mean by an overlap, right? 50% overlap, and once you learn this technique, you can cheat it. But 50% overlap is exactly what's, what's important. And I'm going to come around to your side and I'm gonna draw on the board and then uh, I'll throw the gun back in your hand. We're, you're not done yet, you're not off the hook. So here's your panel. Our spray pattern is this wide, so we're going, we've come over here, that's a pass. Step down 50%. We're coming back this way and we've got our 50% overlap that way. And then we're stepping down again, another 50% and we're bridging, it's stacking. It's like the way your shingles lay on your roof. They're 50% overlap. That's what you gotta keep in mind. Yes, sir? What about the upper half of the first half that doesn't get done? What you wanna do, a good question. You said, what about the upper half of the first pass? What you're trying to do is have one even envelope of paint over the project. So you're staggering it. I'm 50% here, I'm working my way down. I'm pushing the paint across the panel. So. Good question, but basically once you've done your pass, and step down and moved, 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 what you've done is create a very smooth, even coat of paint on that panel. So. The first pass won't have as much paint as the second pass. Oh, I understand what you're saying. So the first edge of that first pass only gets half of, of the flu. Yeah. Technically, yes, you're right, but by the time you have a base coat application, typically is about four coats, three coats if you're lucky, if it's a solid color like black. So by the time you've done that, you're gonna see and you can use your eyes and tell whether you've got coatings there. And also, here's the other thing too, and we're just talking about the top of the panel. When we push all the way to the top of the panel, when I start here, now I can bridge that. And I can pick up my wet edge and drag that down so that it's a really good question, a great observation, but that patch of paint that only has half of a coat on it, well now you're correcting that and you're, now you're pulling it down below. So what we're gonna do, Bill, is get you to do it again and really, 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 I'm gonna get this out of your way, really focus on your technique on that wrist action, on like that. Okay, so just give me a little bit of air coming out of there. Okay, come across, speed up. Okay, here's another thing you're doing. All right, how many people have ever studied martial arts? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about with a ready stance. A ready stance is with your ankles about shoulder width apart. And I need a volunteer. Are your knees okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, no, I'm not going to kick your knees. <laughs> Come on. I'm Canadian. I don't kick people's knees. So, actually, I'm American now. Okay, let's turn around. Face the nice people. Um, put your ankles together. I promise I won't push you over. Watch this. He's very unstable. He's very unstable like that. So now, your ready stance. Your ankle's about the same width as your shoulder. I can't push you over now. It's this very simple thing. So what that does is give him a lot of stability. Now, kind of cut your knees just a little bit like that. So now what that gives you the ability to do, and Bill, I want you to do this as well. It gives you the ability to move your body like this. It's kind of a dance. So uh, go ahead and put that back in the cup. Thanks, and what's your name? Dick. This is Dick. Dick's a great volunteer. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. He walked out of it unscathed, people. It's all good. So what I want you to do, yeah, you got the ready stance, all that kind of stuff, and move side to side like this, all right? So what that does, what, what I saw you doing is that you were standing still and you were spraying 
So now what you can do is keep your arm more still and move your body. So give that a shot. Try that. You know what I'm saying, right? Okay, so now he's gonna use his ready stance. Cut your knees down just a little bit. Get comfortable. And, and now, and correct your technique, now you can move your body at the shoulders. Don't spray paint yet, but move your body at the shoulders. See how much easier it was to maintain your technique? And, and just move your whole body. It ain't sexy. It's not, you know, it's, it's not, you know, it's not a fashion show. You got a paint suit on and everything like that. But what you're after is maintaining that parallelity, that 90 degree perpendicular gun position to your panel. So whatever it takes to get there. So now what I want you to do is do another pass. Start here, because you're putting way too much paint on there, pal. You're gonna get a run. Um, I'm gonna correct your technique again. Okay, so see where your arm is? Move your body this way. Have your arm out in front of you. See, I'm, I'm not even painting and I'm, this is what I want. I want to be comfortable. I want to be in my comfort zone. There you go, that's it. All right, so now start again. Yeah, see how much easier that was? And your, your edge is almost perfect. You made a perfect pass that way. So start again, do your 50% overlap and come here and spray and finish the next pass and then stop. Yeah, good enough, you stopped. I didn't want you to stop, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. But that's the basic analogy. So um, give Bill a hand. He just performed his first paint job. Thank you so much for being a good volunteer. Here's a, yes sir. I have the same gun yep. on the gun. On some of the literature you read, it says you need 10% of the tip. 10 yes, PSI of the yes, tip. and you just stepped in, didn't you? Yeah. How do I know I get 10 PSI of the tip by the day? Yeah, and you corrected me. I said it was 20 PSI at the tip. Um, you can't ever tell that because there's no air cap gauge. You basically 10 PSI at the cap means 30 PSI at the inlet. There's your equation there. So we've just burned a bunch of paint. Paint's expensive. Catalyst is expensive. We've got a puddle of black right here, and you know Bill's going to be cutting and buffing runs for a long time. But so how do you get practice and get that technique down without spraying paint? Your gun distance from the panel is about six inches. So what we're gonna do is create an inexpensive training guide. If I can feel the masking tape, and if it'll do what I ask it to do. You know what? <laughs> we're Duct tape, razor blades, and Sharpies, and you can build a car. <laughs> While I'm doing this, man, uh, you guys have been walking around. What an incredible SEMA show. Is it not? The hardware, it's Mopar heavy, which I love. I'm a Mustang guy, but I love the old Mopars. Uh, there's some beautiful machines. Um, it, it's, it's just an amazing place where you can come in, in, in see the best of the best of the best. And it's empowering and exciting and humbling all at the same time. And it's a fantastic show, so I'm, I don't know, it's, it's just a great thing. To be able to come to a, a trade show like this is fantastic. So what, what am I, it's, it's stupid. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a spray gun with a, with, a, with a paintbrush. But what it is, it's a training guide and it will teach you the muscle memory. Okay, I need another volunteer, just, just real quick. TC, come here. All right, you've painted before, I know you have. Here's, here's the goal, here's what you're trying to do. There's your gun distance. Keep the, those bristles touching there, but just barely, and make a pass. Okay, stop. He's a painter, I've seen his paint jobs. Bay One Customs, he's got a blog. He's a really good painter. And he was bouncing like Daffy Duck going down that panel, it's tough. So go, it's tough and really focus and try and just barely scoot that brush across. So what that's gonna do, thank that you. Feels awkward it feels awful. It does feel awkward, but, that, but you gotta maintain that perfect spray distance. And that spray, that brush taped to your gun, as silly as it sounds, um, it teaches you to be a robot. It teaches you to be a robot and it, it costs no paint. There's, it's a dry application. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things to where you can create your muscle memory 
that neuron path, you can develop that and put that in your brain before you pull the trigger on the first panel. So it's a training technique and it's a great technique. Uh, if you ever get a chance, go to bay1customs.com. TC's got a blog with all his customers' vehicles and, um, and you can see the, the incredible craftsmanship and the work that this guy does. So give him a hand. Right, thanks. Yeah, thanks man, appreciate right. it. And um, one of the cool things about being partnered with Eastwood is that we're developing tools. We're developing a training kit, and it's going to include a lot of the things that I'm talking about. And it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a companion booklet, DVD, and we're going to bundle it with a spray gun, and it's going to be basically a lesson plan in a can and get people that are young and new painters off to a really good start and create that successful first experience. And the thing that I've learned about training is that we don't ever know too much to relearn some of the fundamentals. It's all about the basics, it's all about the fundamentals. And to, it, it can even be a brush up or a touch up technique thing. So look for that to come about mid-year next year. It's, it's, it's gonna be a neat thing and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say that, that um, I, I don't know, it, it, it's something that's coming down the pike and I'm very excited about it. So, uh, who's painted a, a whole car, full car? Just a question, no judgment. When you're doing a hood, where do you start? You start at the side or the middle? Center. Okay. This guy, uh, what's your name? Roger. Roger. Hey, man. Same by the night. You too. Absolutely. And I'm going to debate technique with you just a little bit. Roger's technique is to start in the middle because it's comfortable, right? Now, you're tall. What are you, 6'2"? No, yeah, okay. So his rationale for that is keeping the dirt out of the paint. So he starts in the middle, works his way down, walks around, picks up his wet edge in the middle and comes over here. So that works for Roger. Roger's a good painter, I can tell. You know, you're, you, you've got a, a hot rod shop and you do nice work. I've never seen it, but I can tell you, you know what you're talking about. My technique is way different. What I was taught is way different. And it's basically you're chasing your wet edge. It's called a push-pull method. So. What I want you to try and experiment with both techniques. There's more than one right way to get it, but this is my technique. And what I want to do is I want to push to the middle from the outside edge. I'm still comfortable. I'm creating an envelope, an envelope of paint over to here. I'm right in the middle. So now I'm comfortably walking because we have time. We've got a flash time. We've got a window. I'm picking up my wet edge right here. and I drag it off the panel like that. So I haven't started in the middle, and I've got this very smooth, even coat of paint all the way across that hood. Here's what happens. When you, uh, when you start in the middle, and this is not my opinion, and you found a way to, to, uh, to compensate around it. When you start in the middle, and you got your pass, and you're overlapping. You pull your way to the edge. You can't really help. You know, you've given enough time to where this is going to haze just a little bit. So we have the tendency to overcompensate, and, and we're not going to have the perfect 50% overlap right there. So now what I'm doing is I'm stacking up that paint as I'm coming out. And I've got a bit of a heavy stripe in the middle of that hood. Now, it's not much. It's not much. And there's guys that I know that are really, really good painters that use that technique, and they, they work around it. But what you're doing, by the time you have a coat of sealer, you have four coats of base, and you've got three coats of clear. Some clear coats you can stack up. So, so you've got now uh, eight coats of material, and it's just a little heavy in the middle every time. So now you've given it an extra two to three coats as far as mill film goes, or film, film build goes. So now you've got a heavy spot in the middle. I'm just... I'm just saying you want to think about that when you're doing multiple coats, candy jobs, tri coats, things like that. The other thing is, you know, when you go to, to, a, to a, a wheel opening, do you start at the opening first? Right. So he said he usually details it out first, gets his edges, and makes sure that he covers them first, and then coats the panel. Well, I'm going to do it on both sides. So I'm doing that. I've just got my edge. And I've got my edge there, but what's on the outside of that panel? I've also painted the outside of that panel. So now I know I've got to have three coats or four coats of base coat coverage. So I'm starting there again. Well, by the time I got my first coat, now I've got two coats there. So I've got an extra coat, 
and now it's building up on that edge. So I'm just saying think about it, you know, figure out what works for you. But my techniques are to coat it, treat it like a box, don't get fooled into the style lines, let your overspray clear, get down, take a look, see if it's ghosting, see if you need paint there, and feather it in that way, and, and you know, just gently feather it in, don't do a full coat, Give it what it needs, but don't overcoat. So those techniques work really well for me. Obviously, you found a way around them. You can get there. Try both. See what works for you. Do some spray out panels. But, um, but that, to me, gives me that envelope of paint that I'm after. And the application is one coat at a time, instead of stacking two or three coats in the middle where I should only have one or two. So uh, just, just kind of a food for thought thing. So perfect paint equals perfect technique. Perfect technique is a learned thing. It's not a God-given gift. It's, uh, it's something that, that we, uh, we aspire to it. It's like the perfect golf game. It doesn't exist, but we want it. We want to chase it. And the more we do this, the better we get at it. Um, <laughs> air hose handling, just basics. When I'm spraying, typically what I'm doing is holding my hose in one hand, I'm spraying with the other because I can feed it in. If I'm not, and this will happen if you drop it or whatever, another technique to think about is over your shoulder. If you're doing a roof panel or a hood or something like that, you don't have to think about it. It's just dragging over your shoulder. Kick your shoulder up a little bit, it guides that hose. So it's those things, and I know you guys have thought about this stuff, and you know nobody wants that hose slapping the side of the panel. So it's another technique that you need to learn. Um, sir? Okay, like, great question. Yeah. Okay, his question is, what do we do about the clothes? We're short guys, we're feeding across the center. Um, first of all, I'm using a spray suit. I use the shoot suits, I like them. I can wear, I, I've got a shoot suit that's five years old. You know, it's not the paper suits that tear when you, you know, it's, it costs about 25, 30 bucks for a shoot suit. I can throw that in the wash and it's perfectly clean. I, you know, I'm cheap. <laughs> I don't want to buy them every week or every paint job. And, you know, because they are a little spendy, but it's reusable. So in the first place, I'm protecting um, the project from me. Um, more than half of the trash and dirt that falls into a panel doesn't come from the air. It comes from the painter, right? It comes from your air hose you didn't clean off. It comes from debris that fell off the gun. If you're wearing a cotton T-shirt when you're painting, they expel lint like crazy. It's really bad. I use wristbands. I'm in Tennessee. It gets hot. I used cotton wristbands one time to paint a car. It was a white car, Cadillac tricoat, black lint all in the hood. Redo. I lost my butt on that paint job. So I learned the hard way that black wristbands that leak cotton over, uh, lint, not the best thing to do. So your question, uh, I know I'm getting long-winded with this, but it's really important. Your question about what do you do when you're a short guy, you're, typically what I do is I've got my shoot suit on and I'll do one of these and now I've kept that shirt or my shoot suit from building me in there and I can get in there and if I hit that panel I might as well go swimming on it because I've gone way too far so you, your clothing you can control that just like you can control everything else in your environment right so you know I've just it, take the steps to to make sure and what I'm gonna get to next you know with the with the brush the important thing that I'm trying to say is that you can practice this without, without, without blowing paint on the panel. And you do dry runs and do, do a dry painting process. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is, is what I call leapfrogging. I have this in the Paint Your Own Car video. Um, basically, it's stepping, it's mapping out your paint job. And I highly recommend that you go through this process before you spray paint because as short guys, I need scaffolding sometimes. If I'm painting a conversion van, I gotta build something to stand on because I can't reach up there. So a, a dry run on your paint job is really important and you can practice this technique. You can figure out where you need you know, your bucket to stand on to get up into the middle of the roof and things like that. So do a dry run, it's really important. And the other thing is to, typically what I wanna do is start at the back of the car and move my way forward. I, I take that back, I start at the roof, work my way to the back, work my way forward. I'm gonna do a little drawing here and that is gonna fall and break somebody's heart. But I wanna give you a paint job map. I'm an artist, I'm just saying.
So it's a squash out, but it's a Frogger version of a car, okay? There's your roof, there's your door, quarter panel, deck lid, hood, fender, fender. The way I want you to try this is leapfrogging. One through, I think it's probably 10. So we're going here. Panel number one. I'm an idiot. One. There, okay. Panel number one, I'm starting on the roof. I'm starting at the sail panel. I'm pushing my way to the middle. Okay, and I walk around the car and I drag my way from the middle to the other side and I walk down the sail panel. Then I go to the other side of the car, leapfrog to my wet edge on this side of the sail panel. So, this is panel number two. Then I go down the quarter panel to my rocker. Then I leapfrog over to panel number three, which is the other quarter panel. Over three, I pick up my wet edge on that sail panel, I drag my way down to the quarter, and then the back end is what I do next. That's panel number four. So I paint using the push-pull method, creating that nice smooth envelope of paint, pushing it this direction over here, pick up my wet edge on my quarter that I just painted, and I work this way to the other wet edge of the quarter, and what I've done is paint half the car in a very nice, very kind environment where I'm not chasing a dry edge ever. So then number five, I'm going over here on my door. I've got a wet edge on that quarter panel. I spray my way to the door. I leapfrog, again, silly term, keep it in your brain, over here to your other door, number six. So now I leapfrog over to here, my other fender, and I pick up, I don't have a wet edge here, but I've got a wet edge here, and I'm working my way up the fender, over the middle of the hood, and then down the fender, and if I've got a valance panel, I finish that up. So now what I've done is I've created an envelope of paint that starts here and flows over the car, and I don't have a dry edge. I'm not walking around the panel, and I'm not chasing a dry edge. If I did this and painted the circumference of the car and started over here, by the time I got around to the other side, let's face it, if you've got a full-size pickup truck or a large car, it can take up to 45 minutes to do a single coat of paint, right? So if you're, if you're not chasing your wet edge all the way around the car and creating this envelope of paint by leapfrogging, silly term, remember it is important, then you can have dry spray, you can have overspray, you can have texture issues and things like that as well as solvent problems. Because if it's a hot day and it skins over, sometimes it can dive and wrinkle, it can cause all kinds of stuff. So think about this, and again, it's in the Paint Your Own Car DVD. Um, but it's, it's a way to control your environment and create that nice envelope of paint all over the car. So, I don't know, I, I don't know, has anybody got any, any questions? How do you start an all over paint job? Where do you start? On the roof. On the roof, yeah. Okay, so we're on the same page there. So your rover spray goes down. Yeah. You start at the bottom and then you come up and your rover spray goes on the roof. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, typically I work against the airflow, which, which uh, what that means is if the air's coming this way across the car, yeah, if it's a cross draft, then I'll start at the back. Instead of blowing overspray onto the unpainted panels, I'm blowing overspray onto the wet panels, and it'll sink in and it'll lock in. Because it, what it'll do is if I'm starting at the back of the car, by the time I get to the front, if my airflow is chasing that overspray to the front, I've got some dusty crap that's going to show up in my paint. So I work against the airflow, and that's something else that, that and you kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So, you know, coming full circle and back to center. Achieving the perfect paint job, it's about, it's up to you guys, it's up to us. And, and controlling our environment is, is, uh, is a way to do it. And it's, it's kind of fun and we can, we can do things like the paintbrush, we can use craft paint on cardboard, we can get body shop takeoff panels and do spray outs and create that muscle memory, develop that technique before you pull the trigger with actual paint. And Bill did a great job, he's got a run right here. Um, the color sanding and buffing DVD, I teach you how to pull runs out of cars. So, so I gotta keep dogging it, man, I just do. But, um, I, yes, sir. A question uh, related to this, how about safety? I, I'm afraid to use like isocyanide paints. Yes. I read you gotta have a full suit on, yeah. air draft. Absolutely. You've, you beat me to the punch. He was asking about safety. Uh, this can be intimidating. These are toxic chemicals we're dealing with. You know, let's, let's face it. It's, it, it can be dangerous if we're idiots. If we're not idiots and we protect ourselves, then it's a very safe thing to do. Um, let's start with closing. The, the, the shoot suit is designed more to keep contamination from, to, from getting onto the car. 
it's, it's about containing your trash and dirt onto your body as well as protecting you from the paint. You know, uh, if you spill paint on a, on a spray suit, it's going to leach through whatever. But it's not 100% protection. It's not like a fire suit. But a painting suit is a nice step towards getting that overspray and keeping it off of your skin. Uh, the biggest thing about paint is the respiratory system that we have to protect. Uh, you have to use the proper air breathing protection. This is a... It's a NIOSH approved, it's a dual cartridge respirator. It will filter out polyacetylcyanate contamination. Um, we've got this, we've got some scrub on the face. Uh, this won't seal against that. This is a negative pressure mask, you know what I mean by that? You're pulling air in through the filters. So you're sucking air in through the filters. Well, if there's a gap around the seal on the outside, you're sucking it in behind the filter. If you've got a weird-shaped nose that doesn't conform perfectly to this, it's coming in on your nose. I remember seeing my dad coming in from paint jobs, and, and he would have the color of the car that he shot right here because he didn't fit his mask to his body. There's ways to do that to fit your mask properly. Make sure you've got a good seal. These are safe if you wear them properly, if you wear them properly. And a big part of that is that there's a window. This is an active charcoal filter. There is a 24-hour window to which that active charcoal will filter all the bad stuff out. After that, it's a good dust mask, and that's about it. So my point is, that's 25 bucks. If you're doing a project stretched out over six months, painting and all that kind of stuff, how many of those have you bought? You spent a couple hundred bucks on masks, right? So you can spend another hundred bucks on top of that and get a fresh air supply, and you never have to worry about that again. You've got positive pressure, meaning more air coming in than you can ever breathe, so it's forcing any contamination. If my dad had that, he would not have had lime green right here when he painted a, a Dodge Dart. So positive pressure, uh, forced air, you know, it's, it's just the way to go. Yes, it's more money. We're all tool junkies, let's face it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting and you're talking to me. So invest in the equipment. If you're going to do more than one paint job especially, get a fresh air mask. It's just the safest way to go. This is effective, otherwise they would not be able to put NIOSH approved on it, which is the sanctioning body and a safety, their safety cops. But, yeah. So anyway, long story short, safety is absolutely, absolutely important. Common sense. Unfortunately, it's not so common anymore, but you just have to think your way through this stuff. And we tend to get in a hurry. Uh, and, you know, I find myself sometimes mixing paint. I want to get in the booth. I want to try it, and I don't have gloves on. And it actually crosses my mind to go in there and spray without gloves on, and it's a mistake. Cover yourself. We, we've got, um, you know, gloves that can protect us, that are solvent-proof, solvent-resistant, and keep that paint from in our systems. Goggles, if you're wearing a mask. My Fresh Air Supply has a full-face helmet, uh, and I don't ever worry about it. I don't smell paint. And when I'm wearing my shoot suit, it's not impermeated into my clothes. So yes, it's safety awareness, but it's also, it's, it's keeping that junk off your clothes and out of your system. So uh, don't be intimidated by it, but please, please, please educate yourself to it, you know? And err on the side of caution, because stuff can happen. You know, uh, it, it's, it's worth the investment in your lungs to protect your respiratory system. You know, and the fresh air supply systems are not that expensive, relatively speaking, by the time you've bought a half a dozen of those or a dozen of those over the course of your project. So safety, 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 safety. We want to live to paint another day. So I want to thank you guys for standing here listening to me run my mouth. And thank you so much for your help. And thank you for, for, um, for having the interest in doing that. There's, there's one other thing that, that I need to say before I'll shut up. I feel that it's our responsibility to take the skills that we've learned and pass them on to other people. If you have the opportunity ever to mentor somebody, to give some kid at a car show some advice, if he says, how'd you do that, just tell him. Let's take on this responsibility and, and let's face it, none of us are getting any younger. We want young people to come in and have these, these uh, unbelievable experiences, the camaraderie of this industry, of this hobby, of this, this lifestyle that we have. So pass on this information, people, and, and, and let's, uh, let's share this knowledge and pass it down to the next guys that are coming up. So thank you so much for standing and, and uh, helping me with this demo and, and good luck. I'm available online at the Eastwood Restoration Forum. I've got Kevin's Corner. If you need to ask me questions specifically, great. If I can't get to it, there's a lot of great tech help with Eastwood. So hit us up online, and thanks again.